but we're going to go to the next question for John. Uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and other government agencies are considering plans that would significantly alter the Biona Wetlands Ecological Reserve. Uh, these plans would include bulldozers to move millions of cubic yards of earth and remove the current flood control levees that contain Biona Creek. What is your position uh, on these potential plans and what would you like to see done with Biona Creek? What would you do if elected to ensure that your position prevails? Uh, I'm opposed to the plan. I'll just start by saying that. I think it's really important that we not only protect our oceans but the estuaries where our rivers as trickling as they may be uh, meet the oceans. I think one of the biggest issues that we have and we have to remember is that we live in a desert. Uh, you know, here we are, beautiful day in April, it's sunny, it's warm, we pray for rain, maybe, you know, four times a year we'll get rain. We live in a desert, and so really the issue is about water management. Uh, all of these uh, rivers and runoffs, what we, we fail to do effectively is to regather that rainwater and resupply the underground aquifers that exist all over Los Angeles. You know, there are other ways about thinking about water. A lot of these dams were meant to collect uh, the water so that our aquifers could be replenished, but unfortunately because of some of the obstruction uh, along these uh, routes, these river routes, uh, most of the water just flows out into the ocean and we're unable to collect it. So I think it's a really important thing. I think that the plans for Bolana Creek are, are short-sighted. Uh, I'm an avid cyclist, so I cycle up and down all the time uh, in that area. I know how beautiful it is and how important it is that we protect it. Uh, I'd also want to say that, uh, you know, uh, when we're thinking about water and water management, historically Northern California really despises Southern California because it seems like we're always being accused of stealing their water. And so I think we have to always be looking at how we're conserving water in new development, uh, making sure that we have appliances that conserve energy, that conserve water, that we're aware about planting natural uh, vegetation uh, it's more suited for desert life rather than some of the water-sucking uh, vegetation that we tend to put out there. I think it's important we address this globally on the issue of water management. Thank you. Chill. Uh, thank you. I opposed the bulldozing and I opposed um, any destruction of the levees. Uh, I think that it's interesting how uh, Bayona Creek, which when uh, we used to fish in it when I was a kid, we called Baloney Creek. Anybody else? Um, <laughs> I think that it's been posed in a way as a kind of war uh, between people who talk about sort of human use, that is not thinking about indigenous species, not thinking about what has happened there since something that started as a flood channel has really become an ecology. And the other side, which is posed as people who only care about non-human species. This is a false dichotomy. I think there's a way for uh, Bayona Creek to be a welcoming place for visitors, to be a place where people can walk, where they can learn about nature and ecology, where they can ride a bike without the kind of destruction that is proposed. I don't oppose a visitor center on the highest level of the ground. I don't like the expanded use of that that's being proposed. We can talk more about that. And uh, John is very right about the use of water uh, in the county, though this is not an aspect of this particular question, but it is interesting that in the county we're not using any more water than we did 25 years ago because of conservation. So the notion of con conservation, human use, and protection of species, okay. I think, can all go together. Thank you. Thank you. I, too, uh, am opposed to doing anything to, especially removing the levees in the Biona wetlands. Uh, I grew up in uh, New York on some wetlands, and I absolutely appreciate these environments and how uh, critically important they are here in California now because we've done such a bad job of protecting them to date. And it speaks to a Board of Supervisors issue uh, that came up actually January 14th. I think uh, some of the people assembled here were there, I recognize them, uh, where uh, the the board was giving some money to the Army Corps of Engineers, who are a group that uh, are federally organized, but more or less work with the county on some of these projects, because that is some federal land. And what, what came out was that they were trying to get an expedited um, approval to do some investigations. The, here's the thing. Uh, people came out of the woodwork because they were worried and upset, and appropriately so. In fact, Zev Yaroslavsky abstained from the vote. But for many issues that face our marina and the coast, and we also just passed a land use plan, uh, the board will, 
claim that they're holding hearings and seeking public input, but then, frankly, they ignore it. And this is a huge problem that we're facing in the marina. Right now, Mariner's Village, which is a very important uh, thing to be concerned about, the Blue Herons uh, are in jeopardy in that particular uh, project. We have parking lots that are going to be removed. This is access. Marina Del Rey, just for the record, is about, is about recreation. The charter very specifically said this is for the people of Los Angeles County to enjoy and use as a recreational okay. facility, and I'll save my time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question. We'll start with Bobby. Uh, the city of Los Angeles has recently gone on record banning the process of fracking. Would you support such a moratorium at the county level, and how will you get it done? Uh, thank you. I, 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 have, I will support it. It's on my website, so uh, the answer to that is yes. I think the important thing that people maybe don't fully understand about this process is that the wells that they drill and the chemicals they inject go through the, the water. Back to John's comment about the water. Mm -hmm. So the pipe is actually running through the underground water table where we hope most of LA's water will be stored in the future. It's actually the best way to access water. For example, in Santa Monica, another thing we got done was to sue the oil companies, and we now get about 70% of the water that's served in Santa Monica comes from wells under San Vicente. So we, are, we have a plan to get to 100%, by the way. That can be done elsewhere in the county if there's a plan for that. But this fracking thing raises the question of what would happen if that pipe broke into the aquifer? That'd be the end of your water supply, and it, it could be the end of it for a very long while. So that level of risk, to me, is unacceptable. I, yeah. Yeah, I would absolutely support stopping fracking in Los Angeles. And you know, this issue kind of gives me hope because it shows me that when people come together collectively, even if there's an economic upside, we can fight it. And we did fight it. And, and it gives me so much, you know, like I feel blessed I live in Los Angeles because we're awake. All over the country, fracking is happening. Pennsylvania, everywhere. It is scary, and I am hoping that we can be, by doing this at the LA County level, Los Angeles City Council just did that, we can be a beacon of hope for these other towns that aren't blessed with the type of people who are going to put people before corporations and people before profits. So if I'm elected, I will continue that and be a beacon of hope, and we need to get people educated all across our country, not just in Los Angeles, but we need to tell them about why we're doing it and how we can have alternatives to oil. We can go off of oil. We can be carbon free by 2033. We have got to be the leaders. We all live in California because we care and we are blessed and we have an obligation to show the rest of the world that they may not be able to live here, but they can act like they live here. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully we'll do that. So I would definitely support it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. John. Uh, yes, opposed fracking. That's, that's the easy part. Uh, I actually have to give tribute to the, I think, the one legislator who's done more on this than anybody, and that's uh, the Assemblywoman Betsy Butler, who was here uh, just a moment ago. She really uh, took this issue on. And, and some say that it actually you know, cost her her seat because she was willing to take on the oil companies and they hit her so hard in the election. So, but Betsy and I, just so you know, we've been friends since we were young Dems in our 20s, and, and we would be married, but for the fact that we have the same taste in men. So it's really not going to happen. Uh, but other than that, uh, you know, Betsy and I have sort of palled around for, for many, many years, 25 years, we've been very dear friends, and she's taught me a lot about this issue. I, I, I'm a, a native Angelino, and I will say that having been raised here, uh, in, in a community called Santa Fe Springs. If you know where that is, it's over by Whittier, where there are oil derricks next to playgrounds, pumping up oil you know, out of the ground constantly. We know that oil is part of the story of Los Angeles. That's where Doheny you know, got its name. And, and, and having been here my whole life, I can tell you when I was a kid, I do remember dairy farms in Los Angeles, and I remember citrus groves. And, and you know, one had a pleasant smell and one did not. Uh, you know, but that was part of life in Los Angeles. As we move now into this new century, Los Angeles has become a very different place than the place that I was born. And ultimately, we need to think as a community about getting off of our dependence on automobiles, oil, traffic, 
and moving instead to walkable, livable communities like we have in my town. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next question, and I'll start with Sheila. The, the state's prison realignment program has saddled counties with the responsibility for lower level felons without additional funds to manage them. What is your position on the early release of prisoners due to realignment, and do you support alternative measures, whether it's pretrial release, electronic monitoring, additional treatment outside incarceration, uh, other reforms, to reduce the burden of overcrowding? How, do, how, do this, how does the county deal with this, this very large problem given to them by the state? I'm going to talk really fast because a minute and a half is not quite enough time. <laughs> there are two populations involved in this, and they are two different populations. On the one hand, Governor Brown was ordered to reduce the population of prisons. Those are not low-level offenders. Those are not the low-level non-sex uh, offenders, right. non-violent offenders, non-drug uh, dealing offenders. In order to do that, he wanted to move those prisoners to the local level. That's county jails. County jails. Uh, under realignment are now where we want to incarcerate low-level offenders. That was what realignment was about, not the transfer of prisoners, just to understand. It was about not sending low-level offenders to prison, but rather imprisoning them locally. And those low-level offenders, again, are non-sex offenders, non-violent offenders, and not drug dealers. So in a way, the early release program doesn't bother me as much because whether a person gets out in six days or 30 days, they are still out at the end of a month. The question is, what have you given them while they're there? What have you required of them while they're there so that they can make the transition into, back into society? Are they getting literacy? Are they getting uh, a substance abuse treatment? Are they getting a little mental health treatment? That's what I want the county to do, is to make certain that these low-level offenders that are being uh, uh, reunited with their families and back in society get the kind of help that they need in order to make the transition. Thank you. This is a subject that I'm very familiar with. I attended the Citizens Commission on Jail Violence meetings which were concurrent to the realignment process. The realignment process as uh, Sheila just explained is about new characters coming back to LA County who have uh, been in jail and they are not violent or dangerous, but we have done a very, very bad job of providing the services and the kinds of um, re-entry aspects that we need. We, we have lagged embarrassingly in the category of split sentencing. We have, uh, we should be, and one of the most important urgent crises we're facing has to do with mentally ill individuals being incarcerated. And we have done just an, a, a bad job of diverting people from that process. The facts are that jails uh, are not a therapeutic environment and we um, have a robust sheriff's budget, custody budget, that is pawing at solutions that will never take place in an environment where there are four individuals in a small cell uh, and some of whom are mentally ill. Um, so this process uh, needs to be changed and the state uh, and the county, uh, though one of our one of my colleagues here says that we it's the same are very opposed in at times on this issue and in fact we need to be working together uh, and the the county's uh, solutions to date um, have failed the AB 1022 funding there was 500 million dollars and we qualified mm -hmm. for zero if it's AB 1022 maybe okay. 900 but I'm done thank you thank you okay it's an embarrassment This is a really uh, fundamental idea, this realignment. It's, it's fundamental because the LA County Jail today, I think it's correct to say, is the biggest mental health institution in the world. There are 13 or 14 or maybe one or two more or less full-time pharmacists work there, medicating the prisoners. prisoners. This system arose back in the day when I think people didn't fully understand mental illness. We've come a long way in our understanding of mental illness. There's mental health parity in the law. Uh, and yet we continue to lock up people who are mentally ill and keep them in jail. There's a proposal to spend $1 billion of your money on the new jail. That's going to go forward unless some people get elected who are fired up to stop it. 
I promise you I will try to stop it. I will try to take a portion of that money and a portion of the realignment money that's coming to the county to use for mental health care services in the community, which is proven time and again in Contra Costa County, all over the United States. That's how you treat mentally ill people. You do not put them in prison. You treat them in the community and you spend money with psychiatric social workers, with psych people with psychiatric training. You do not train police officers in psychiatric training. You train them in catching bad guys and keeping bad guys incarcerated in a serious way for a long time. That's the second part of the thing. You need beds, John can speak to this better than mm -hmm. I can, for the bad guys and you need to put the mentally okay. ill people in community-based care. All right. Thank you. So next question, for starting with Pamela. So five supervisors govern a, a, a county with 37 departments, over 100,000 employees. The, the size of the district is larger than 13 states. Do you think a five-member board is sufficient to undertake the legislative and executive functions for such a massive bureaucracy? <laughs> Well, my middle name is Reform. And I think the one thing we need to do is look at this system. When we were formed in 1850 and then and again in 1913 with five supervisors, started with three, we had about 750 people. We have over 10 million people and five kings or queens ahead of it all, the heading us. I would look at this. I do not think it's very democratic, personally. And I would work to increase the board and I'd use the slush funds to fund the additional supervisors um, because we do have, they do have them. Um, and so I would definitely be in favor. This would look, it kind of take into consideration the redistricting issues too. Look at the composition of the board and look at Los Angeles County. How many people are there, Latinos, blacks, Asians, whites, men, women? It's really not reflective of our society. So I think we need to use that looking at the five versus the nine or maybe even 11 to make it more reflective of who we are as a community because we all bring different life experiences, different priorities, and sometimes the people who are up there are being referred to by the LA Times as kings and queens are not going to put our, our issues first. So I think the more people we have up there, um, the better to get other issues that have been set aside for the last 20 or so years and not addressed because of who's up there. So um, I would be in support of it. And I look forward to okay. working with you, the people, to make it happen, because it's going to take you to make it happen. Thank you. John. Uh, I supported the local uh, ballot measure to increase the number of uh, supervisors. But as you all know, the voters of Los Angeles County rejected that idea. Uh, there's this thing in human nature that everybody seems to love, you know, their elected officials. They just want to term limit everybody else's, right? And that's just part of human nature. I may say I love Xavier Slavsky, and I do, uh, but, you know, most people think that less politicians is a better solution rather than more politicians. So it's not likely to pass. So I think that leads us to the question then how best to manage the fact that a supervisor is going to represent two million people. I have, a, I have a different uh, philosophy here than uh, my friend Sheila Kuehl. My, my experience as local government has not been one of friendly partnership with Sacramento. Uh, Sacramento, I think, unfortunately burdens the back of local cities and counties. Sacramento passes unfunded mandates on cities and counties. Sacramento took away our redevelopment money. Sacramento gave us realignment. So cities and counties, I think, are best left to handle the local needs of people. And so I think it's really important that the supervisor, instead of looking to work with Sacramento or Washington better, work with the cities in this particular supervisorial district. Because the cities have the most hands-on work with local communities. West Hollywood, Venice, and Santa Monica, they all look pretty much, you know, very similar in a lot of ways. We share a lot of common values. It's not true of Van Nuys, and it's not true of Valley Village or other parts of this district that have to be handled differently. And I wouldn't try to impose my thoughts on people in that section of town without talking to the Val Valley uh, City Council members who are, are serving there. Okay. So I think it's really important to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me clarify. I didn't say that the city and the, the county and the state were the same. I said that the county is tasked by the state to carry out all of its programs. That is just the law. 58 counties in California are told by the state what to do in terms of mental health and funded. In terms of 
providing health care for the poor and fund it and told, figure out how to do it. Uh, I have not supported the expansion of the Board of Supervisors numerically because I served in a, uh, a body of 40 people representing 37 million people in the state of California, the state senate. Do you think that's a more democratic body? Uh, just because I only represented a million people instead of two million people, it, and, the, and the added expense of doubling or adding four more people, fully staffed, having uh, you know interns, interface, etc. I don't think you get more bang for the buck. I think the answer is, what does your district office or your district offices do in terms of constituent services? And we were almost always given very high ratings by our constituents in terms of answering their needs quickly. That's the answer. Are you listening? Are you taking care of? I mean, the cities have a great job, but the county has to take care of all the poor people, all the kids on healthy families, all the mentally ill, okay. all the homeless. So I think it, the answer is yeah. local services, not expanding the board. Okay. Thank you. All right. Starting with you, uh, Eric. County social workers are currently carrying caseloads that are double the state standard. Uh, would you support both the legislation and the funding to mandate adherence to caseload standards defined and recommended by previous legislation? Okay, this is about the Department of Children and Family Services who are not familiar with this subject. The social workers are the individuals who go into the community and um, will either make the, the tough, will make the tough decision as to whether or not a child is in sufficient protection to take them out of that home or not. And the caseloads are in the 30s and it's way too high. Uh, and we should definitely consider all the options, including legislation, to lowering that caseload. But on last week, when the rest of my colleagues were campaigning, I went to the Blue Ribbon Commission's uh, penultimate hearing on this subject. This is a group that's been put together. Zev said it was activity, not achievement oriented, which I was upset by. This is a very solid group who've made very concrete recommendations. And the most urgent one is to have a czar, they've claimed, that would help uh, break down the silo mentality in county government that causes us at the current time to be failing, basically, at our own effort. What, what's happening is uh, different departments are not communicating with one another. I'm talking about public health versus the DCFS. A very specific example that I've gone into the weeds has to do with exactly these, these nurses. 80 public health nurses uh, are not permitted under the current federal rules to do what we need them to do, which is serve as a check and a balance on the decision making that's happening in the field. Another horrible detail is that the individuals who are out there making that decision are our most inexperienced social workers, while older, more senior um, veterans of the program okay. are uh, not doing it. We need to turn that upside down and make the changes that are critical. And this will all be coming out on April 18th, so look for it. Thank you. One of the premises of your question was, where would the funding come from? And what I've learned in studying the budget is the funding is already there. There are about 500 unfilled positions in the current budget. Maybe that's varied since the last time I looked at it because I know the board made a decision to try to hire people more aggressively. But the big problem, the big problem isn't so much these processes, although they're important. The big problem is that the prestige of being a social worker, the kind of work that people are able to do has declined and it, people don't want to do the jobs. It's very hard for the county to, rec uh, to recruit. They've also required people to have master's degrees, which may be or may not be the right answer. It seems to me in talking to social workers as I have that a bachelor's degree with some significant experience ought to be enough. A uh, couple of facts to think about. Tonight there are 7,000 kids under three, three and under in foster care. So the 40 to one ratio uh, referred to in the question, the best practice in the country is 15 to one. The 40 to 1 ratio can mean that kids of that age are being serviced by someone who has to get in their car and drive to 40 different places. When you hear that, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, even a, whatever you are, you ha it has to break your heart. And that's a thing that requires a, a real sense, I think, of urgency and determination in whoever you're going to vote for. You wanna, and that's been going on for a while, so it's been acceptable. You want someone who's going to come into office and take that 
fact and make something happen quickly. Thank you. Pam? Yeah. Let's talk about facts. Does anyone know what April is? April's National Child Abuse and Neglect Awareness Month. Does anyone know how many kids died today from child abuse or neglect in our own country? Anyone? Raise your hand. Five children die every day in our own country from child abuse and neglect. It's almost the equivalent of two jetliners going down filled with children and nobody's talking. Nobody knows and you're well informed. So we have got to bring this issue up. I've done work with Child Help USA. They are an organization that was started because Nancy Reagan told Sarah Navon, the two founders, about one of the biggest kept secrets in America is child abuse and neglect. And they started this foundation many years ago, 55 years ago. But one of, their, one of the things they do in Arizona, which we need to emulate at the LA County level, is instead of having these kids go tell the teachers about abuse, and then they tell after that the social worker, then they have to get the deputies involved. Instead of having these kids relive these nightmares over and over, what they're doing and what was recommended in the preliminary commission report was that they have a safe place for the kids to go once and all of the other departments go to that kid instead of the other way around. So if I'm elected, what we're going to do is start instituting policies that we look at the kid first and then the staff, we come second. So we have to collaborate. All the departments need that czar to put this together. Social services, the DA's office, the police okay. department. And I'll do that. And I'm looking forward to that. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. This is, this is going to have to be the last question in order to get uh, Sheila and then everyone out on time. And Pam, too. Yeah. So for John, uh, final question. What, what would you do as supervisor to address the ongoing abuse in the county sheriff's department? And, and does the Board of Supervisors have a role I'm to so play glad I got that question. In, the, in the oversight of, of the Sheriff's Department? What are thank, your pri thank priorities? Thank you, because there? when they were talking about jails, I was like biting at the bit over here. <laughs> Made sure to get For it. the last 25 years, I've been working in the criminal justice system. And the problem is not that we have bad deputies. 99% of the sheriff deputies are excellent women and men in the Sheriff's Department. But like anything in human nature, there are some bad apples. The way the system is set up, it's, it's, again, irrational. When a deputy graduates from the academy, he or she starts out in the jail. That's their first assignment. The jails are run in a very militaristic way. You know, uh, but get in line, very command, very military-oriented. And then after they finish their service in the jail, they go out to the streets of Los Angeles, taking that attitude that they developed in the jails onto the streets. That is completely contrary to all community-based policing programs. We want sheriff deputies to be seen as problem solvers, as working with local communities, not in an aggressive, contrary position to communities. So that entire way that, that deputies are, are taken from academy to the streets has got to be changed. There does need to be a citizen's oversight uh, committee. Uh, sometimes just the perception of oversight is enough to create reform. And I think that the new sheriff, whenever he takes office, and there's going to be a he because they're all men, He's going to have a mandate from the public to do something about the sheriff's department and all of the lawsuits that are occurring that the county taxpayers are paying for. Uh, finally, I, I just say that the, the sheriff's department, uh, I think that the way in which they serve different communities uh, across Los Angeles, they've done a really great job, and that's all the time I have, and I'm yeah. going to stop there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, four things that I think the supervisors can actually do, as you know, they don't have actual supervisorial authority over the sheriff who's independently elected, so you can't just say do this like the city can to a police chief. But there are four things that I would uh, think that we could do or that the supervisors could do. One is the Citizens Oversight Commission I think is very important. Sunshine is a very important part of reform. Uh, and, uh, and engaging the fourth estate, the press as well, they have been engaged, they need to get good information. Speaking of good information, the Inspector General, who is already in place, is unable to get information about individual officers and their behavior. Supervisor Molina has complained about this. I think it's a very good issue, and the supervisors need to insist on information getting to the Inspector General. The third thing is, I believe the supervisors lose control of the Sheriff's budget once it's passed because they can't tell the Sheriff not to change line items. I believe we should sequester a portion of the budget under the CEO of the county and require the sheriff to bill 
for specific issues. If, for instance, you're doing it for jail safety, cameras in the jails, the sheriff needs to say, we spent it on cameras, I want the money back. And then you know that it's actually being spent uh, appropriately. Fourth thing is the new academy needs to be further funded. It is uh, a, a very important part of the training for deputies. There's a new element of training, and I believe it needs to be expanded. Thank you. Thank you. And Eric. Thank you. I, like uh, Mr. Duran, I'm pleased to have received this question because it is an issue I am very, very passionate about. And the leadership piece in the Sheriff's Department has been broken for a while, and we currently have an election. I've attended two of the debates myself uh, to try to vet these characters who we'll be working with, and I uh, squeezed the hand of Paul Tanaka in uh, compromise. He's not a guy who I've been supportive of because this is a guy who was uh, advertising that the gray area was something that uh, he wanted to protect officers in. We, we need a zero tolerance policy among our law enforcement, and 99% of them may be good, but 1% of 18,000 employees, I think it's a smaller number of deputies, but is way too many who are engaging in this kind of conduct. And uh, in terms of concrete ways to make it better, the most important piece is this Civilian Oversight Commission, but let's be clear. Uh, the Civilian Oversight Commission that we're all going to line up and say is a great idea, because who wouldn't, um, needs to be tweaked properly. It needs to be um, an organization that has subpoena power and that has um, the power of public scrutiny needs to be the power that we're seeking. You know, Zev Yaroslavsky, uh, well, this is a core issue for me because when he said just a couple weeks ago uh, that he was not going to vote for this and wanted uh, John Cratley, the county council, to report back in uh, X months after this primary election, uh, about whether or not we should change the sheriff's authority, uh, I was just disgusted, frankly, because this has gone on and on and on. And I said about the children's czar a moment ago mm -hmm. that we should, uh, we, I support it, but I want that group to also provide yeah. who specifically we should be doing it. Because with the sheriff's office of inspector general, it took a year and a half in search, which was just yet another delay and yet more and more okay. cases of abuse. And last week, and I'll wrap this up in one second, <laughs> last week we appealed a case where the court found that excessive force, the county has to pay up, and they're appealing it at our expense. It's outrageous. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to move quickly to closing statements. And, and if it's okay with everyone, because Sheila and Pamela have to get out of here, we'll do ladies first. So Sheila, you go ahead for one minute, and then we'll do Pamela. Thank you very much. Thank you all for staying through all of this. It's uh, as I said, it's not maybe the most fun way to spend a Saturday, but uh, you have to admit it is kind of interesting. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I always find it interesting, too, and I apologize to my uh, ballot mates for having to run. We're doing a really fun event where we're showing old Dobie Gillis episodes uh, in Hollywood, and I actually have to show up. Um, so I uh, believe that it's very important for anyone assuming the role of supervisor to have some experience in the areas the supervisors have to oversee. As I said before, it's a huge healthcare system, mental health, public health, foster kids, environmental protection, transportation. Not a big fan of Sacramento these days either, but the experience that I was fortunate enough to gain by being your representative for 14 years, I think is something I would really like to use in order to serve you further. So thank you very much. I appreciate your vote. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. All right. Pamela, one minute, and then we'll get one minute for each of you. Okay? Okay, here we go. First, thank you. I'm trying to take Eleanor Roosevelt's advice today and doing something every day that scares me. So that's why I'm here and I'm running for, to represent you. Um, my 12-year-old son told me something, and I'd love to, to kind of wrap up all of my debates with this. He said to me, He's now uh, ran off to his next activity, but he said, if you want the world to change, you have to do something to help change it and not hope that someone else will change it for you. And that's why I'm running. I want to be an agent of change. I will put people first, before special interests, before corporations. I am here only because of you. And I look forward to working with you and for you to make LA County better tomorrow than it is today. And I am grateful that you took the time out today. I want to say also thank you to the organizers, Cara, and the, the beautiful uh, timers over here. I know you've been doing this all day. <laughs> yeah. so thank you. 
I'm going to be posting you on Twitter right now. Okay. And um, thank you to my fellow colleagues. I'm grateful for all of you, too, and your, the time that you've taken to all be right. here. Thank you. All right. We're going to move to John Duran. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank you all for being here this afternoon, too. And I just wanted to tell you in closing uh, why I think I'm the most qualified. Uh, 14 years in local government has given me a lot of hands-on experience on what it takes to run a local government. My city has $100 million in reserves. For a town of 37,000 people to have $100 million in reserves means people were being really conscious about how to use our taxpayer dollars. I'm very progressive on social issues, and I'm called the conservative on the council because I'm very pro-business and believe we have to have a thriving local economy to produce good-paying jobs in order to collect the taxes to run the government. That's just very simple logic to me. And because of having implemented that sort of reform, whenever we plan our budget, we, we spend exactly what we take in. And because of economic development, any extra revenues we receive, we don't create new programs and spend. We bank it. And we bank it. And we bank it. And that's how we put $100 million into the bank. So Zev's legacy is that he was the moderate on the Board of Supervisors. He kept the county in the black. I can do that, too. And I do ask for your vote on Election Day. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Eric, we're going to go with you next, and then Bobby. Yes. So if I am elected to the third district supervisorial seat, I can assure you of one thing, that the individuals who work for uh, private companies, for big unions, for different interests, who are currently engaged in ripping off the public, are going to be very, very unhappy. Because I am a dogged advocate for what I believe to be fair and reasonable for individuals who don't have the pocketbooks to have 40 fundraising dinners in the last year, like Ms. Kuehl, who had to leave early, or are raising an enormous amount and using an enormous amount of their own money to get themselves into this, uh, this job, which is a job that people have said, whoever gets it among us will be in power for 12 years. I do not agree with Sheila Kuehl that five individuals over 10 million constituents is even close to the appropriate amount of representation. And I thought Pamela Ulick's comment about deploying the $3 million slush fund, which is not really a slush fund, it's a discretionary fund, would be a great way to cover the cost of making a more representative supervisorial democracy here in LA County because we deserve it and the people who uh, we look after deserve it too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then Bob. I want to commend the group and the timers, too. We've been at five of these events, and you two are by far the best timer. <laughs> by far. I also want to commend my long-suffering wife, who is here. Raise your hand, Melissa. The former chairman of the California State Arts Council, right here in the front row. Raise your hand, honey. We didn't talk about the arts. The county manages immense arts institutions. And with uh, my lovely wife here, you have no fear that the arts will be properly managed. She's also working on arts education in K through 12 uh, uh, work now. So she's a tremendous asset to uh, my team. I want to tell you that I'm going to get things done. I'm a progressive and I'm a problem solver. You all need problem solved. We're going into the 21st century. There's a lot of things to do that can be done. As I explained earlier, the things that we did in Santa Monica were all things that people said, oh, you can never get that done. I work with teams to get it done. I have your values at heart. I grew up in a pro-social environment and have a pro-social history. I've worked all over the world and I've worked here. I'm going to bring that capacity, energy, and entrepreneurial energy to you if you give me your vote and give me your endorsement today. Bingo. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for attending. I think we, once again, uh, in both of the debates have a great slate of candidates and uh, don't leave because Cara has some more information for you but thank you very much. Eric just said I want to meet your wife. <laughs> okay um, the balloting we will be closing I'd say in five minutes if anyone has not gotten their ballots yet David in the back is that David back there? Yes he still has the ballot roster. Also we have two candidates who are running for judge here. We have Deborah Losnick Deborah, where are you? In the back there. And Stephen Clave. Where's Stephen? Stephen. On May 3rd, we are having another candidate forum. This time, we will be having all of the judges, and you really want to know who you're standing up in front when you get called to the judge. And uh, also, we're also having the congressional candidates. 
uh, to run for, um, um, what's his name? Henry Waxman's seat. Sorry. <laughs> the 33rd Congressional. We'll also be having Betty Yee and John Perez as representative, and the Secretary of State candidates, and the sheriffs, and the assessors. A long day, but a fun day. It's going to be here. I hope to see you all. Look for your emails. You know, I'll be sending them out. And thank you again all for coming. And thank you, candidates, again. And also, thank you to David Dayen for doing oh, yeah. a great job as oh, moderator. Absolutely, again. The man of a thousand questions. Very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, what, Joan? Oh, yeah, please pick up your flyers and take them with you. Bye. Woof. Last call for ballots. We'll be counting soon. <laughs>